Welcome, my friends, to the Sage Equay Radio Hour, your home for free and critical thinking, and I'm your host, Mike Williams. Tonight, our very special guest is Diane Collins. Diane is an original thinker and one of the foremost thought leaders of her time. She is a master of translating ancient knowledge into quantum modern wisdom that provides a transformative platform for the way we conduct our business and personal affairs. Diane is the creator and author of Quantum Think, a new system of thinking that catapults us from the limits of the outdated old world view of the industrial age and into the more accurate and up-to-date new world view of the current quantum age. Along with her husband and business partner, she consults visionary leaders and executives in the world's leading corporations as well as presenting Quantum Think to entrepreneurs and students, homemakers and professionals, celebrities, and evolutionaries worldwide. My conversation with Diane was extremely insightful as she covers many facets of her book, Do You Quantum Think? New Thinking That Will Rock Your World. And to begin our discussion, I asked Diane, what is quantum thinking? And here is what she had to say. We're in a world today that we all know is undergoing dramatic transformation, rampant change, uh, the institutions and systems that we have become accustomed to have been under the scrutiny of the public eye. You know, we're all looking to see in this emerging new world that has come about through our technology, which is amazing and has really brought the world together. At the same time, it's increased the pace of change. It has given us so many choices that we literally need to think in a new way. And when we undergo such change, people tend to pause and step back and reflect and say, you know, what's important to me now? What do I need to do now? <laughs> Someone tell me, where do I go now? So we all know in order to bring about what is more effective, what is more masterful, what is more efficient for all of us, and that means, Mike, individually, for our families, for our communities, collectively, as a world culture, that we really do know, need to be able to think in a new way. So then we ask the question, well, what is new thinking? Well, most people think or imagine that new thinking means a new idea, a clever, an innovation, a way of looking at something, thinking outside of the proverbial box. But what I discovered is that new thinking is actually a new foundation for thinking, a new basis for thinking. What does that mean? It means this. We're in a quantum age. We have information, knowledge, cutting-edge science, now merging with universal spiritual wisdom that is common to all mastery traditions that has really gone way beyond the way that we have conventionally been thinking in terms of the habitual way we relate to life. And where did that come from? That came from the industrial age. So we're in a quantum age, but our thinking, unbeknownst, <laughs> we're not really aware of it until I begin to make this distinction for people, our thinking is still very much under the influence of what I lovingly call the old world view. What's the difference? Well, the science that started in the 17th century, or called the beginning of rational science, was literally saw the universe as a giant machine. And they declared only physical matter is real. Hence, our whole society is based around what we can glean with our ordinary physical five senses. So you have people on who talk about things that are in the, quote, unseen world or that have to do with the nature of mind, the faculties of mind. And so we think, well, why aren't these things accepted? Our relationship to the earth as a living organism, as the host of our life, that we are in such a separation, conceptual, machine-like, 
way of relating to the world and it really ha- habits of thinking that linear step by step how to world that when we hear about these other kinds of healing modalities or your mind has a literal effect on your circumstances and what you attract it's like people tend to think of that as la la land right you know, and I, of course, have a background <laughs> growing up thinking, why is there this disconnect between how we aspire to be, to live the wisdom, and how we actually are in our lives? And so that was really the motivating factor for me, to finally realize that I thought, what if I could put together all these principles into one system of thinking? We live in a universe of whole systems. Thinking takes place as a system. Thinking is based on what we call the overarching world view. Very simply said, what we believe to be true about the nature of reality and how it works. These assumptions that come to us mostly from science, other great thinkers, maybe theologians too. But the point is, I thought, If I could put this all together, you know, we all know about little energy, little subtle energy here, a little bit of, you know, creates reality over here, a little resonance over here, a little meditation over there. But how does it really all work? If I could put that together in such a way that we can connect to it very simply, and I might say entertainingly, Mike, that we could give ourselves, at least in our awareness, an experience of these principles that are operating within you and me in such a way that it becomes integrated so that we can update our thinking. We can, you know, when people say, oh, our technology is ahead of us, it really is because the technology is all based in the quantum principles not in the machine age principles. So this is a way I invented quantum think as a system of thinking that my husband, Alan Collins, and I, he's my partner in business and in everything, trademarked in 1997 and have been delivering those principles as a system to executives, to officials in the United States government, to the general public, and uh, finally I was able to put it in a book, Do You Quantum Think? New thinking that will rock your world so that we can live this more up-to-date and accurate knowledge, thinking in sync with the way that nature actually works rather than the way it doesn't. How is it, Diane, do you find it a challenge when you go out and you talk to people about this? Because many, many people are really stuck in the five senses. So when you start talking about quantum thinking, many people have a difficult time getting their heads wrapped around that because it's just something that they're really not aware of. It's not something that they actually do, have been taught, and so on. So how does that work for you? Well, that really is the whole point of my work is to make it easy for people and to see that, as I say in the beginning of Do You Quantum Think, what if there's nothing wrong with us? You know, I listen to a lot of, lot of radio shows. I'm very familiar with so many great people doing wonderful work. Unless you realize that our thinking is not free and independent as we would like to imagine it is, that it's actually shaped by that overarching world view. And when what I was going to say is maybe there's nothing wrong with us. Maybe we're just been unaware of it. And that when you realize, Mike, it's not personal. It's cultural. So when you begin to realize that, wait a minute, the quantum scientists have proven much of what the old Scientific view, it's also known as scientific materialism, classical mechanical worldview, gave rise to machines. Perfect. For our stage of evolution of humanity at that time. They needed to categorize, look outside, look at the data, organize it, categorize it. You know, our scientific disciplines came from it, all of our machinery. Amazing amount 
of genius. But now we're at a time where we need to surpass that. So when you ask the question, do people have a hard time with it? They don't because when you realize, oh, we have been brought up under a set of assumptions that many have been proven to be wrong, and I'll tell you what I mean by that. For example, the scientists, you know, when you look out in the physical only, the physical dimension only, we do look separate from each other. It looks like that objects are solid and fixed. Mm -hmm. And in order to get something to move, you had to exert a pull or a push force on it. Now we know under a high-powered microscope that is not true that what there is is mostly empty space. It's not a fixed reality. It's a reality of energy in flux. The energy is informed by intelligence, or some people say information. So we're kind of in a big mind field. So the old worldview said universe is machine. The new worldview scientists say the universe is more like a giant mind. It's not matter-based. It's consciousness space. So when you look at it from the scientific world view, it starts to make sense. Now, quantum think is not about science. My work is not about science. I'm not a scientist, and I'm not teaching science, although I refer to it. My work is about how the discoveries of science have already shaped the way we think and how we can use the new discoveries to become more masterful in our lives. I'm interested in on an everyday practical, how do we have things work and how do we have a joyful life in not just a step-by-step how-to, but in a masterful way. So when you look at that solid object, matter only fixed and solid, how did that map on to our thinking? Well, when we look in our lives, if you translate the word physical matter as circumstances, this is how it applies to us, circumstances. So when we want to have something happen for ourselves, Mike, we have a goal or we want to change professions or we want to make, you know, most people want to make more money or whatever it is, have track, you know, the perfect mate, whatever it is, these are universal, you know, desires of all of us. Then what do we do? We tend to automatically look in the circumstances to see if it's possible. Now, if you look in the circumstances in any way thinking, and it's not like you're consciously even thinking this. It's like it's just in the background of us. It's like sort of like a vortex of it. If you think that, well, I look at the circumstances, I've never had a great relationship, and then you tend to be in that sort of a state of, what if I can never have it, you know? Yeah. Or, my family's never been rich. What if I can never be rich? Or any of these, what I call, wretched self syndrome thoughts, when you realize that these are not the truth, the fundamental quantum principle. There is no absolute fixed reality. It's what is called in quantum perspective an observer-created reality. It's an observer effect. So whereas the old scientists saw only the physical, so it looked like everything is separate, a conceptual separate reality, the new world view, the emerging scientific view, sees the world as with the observer effect, there is no separation between you, what you hold in mind, in your conscious awareness. There's no separation between what you hold in your awareness and the world out there. There are distinctions, but no actual separations. Mike, this is the great news for us as human beings. Because this means, and we're the focal point, our own human conscious and awareness, because this means when we learn how to use what we don't learn in conventional education, not yet, the natural faculties of mind, the power of intent, of intuition, of how to work with subtle energy, which you do, 
what is the nature of resonance, that everything that manifests comes from a resonant field? How do we generate a resonant field for ourselves personally so that we're attracting what we want in life? And what about I call meditation? The meditative state, the fifth natural faculty of mind, it's not just a practice. It's a state where we, when we say, oh, I'm feeling centered, I'm feeling clear, I'm feeling focused, whatever you're doing, that you can be actively in life, in action, and still maintain that meditative state. Well, when you learn these faculties of mind and how they work together, And we're talking about, we're in a mind-based world. All the science of mind, the Vedantic, the old traditions that are from India and the East. Buddha said all that we are is a result of what we have thought. Well, if we're in a mind-based world, wouldn't it make sense, Mike, to become adept, adroit, with our very own faculties of mind? And that is what we can do quite easily. Most of our clients have been major corporations, companies you would know the name of, and they're mostly senior executives. We work with other managers, too. In some agencies of the United States government, I don't have to go in and have a spiritual conversation with them. When I and my husband and I distinguish these quantum think principles They get it because it's universal wisdom. Once you bring it into someone's awareness in a context that they can accept, the context of science, and then, you know, I like to, of course, show that it's matching the spiritual wisdom, and then give these practices that I give, recreations for the mind and awareness, so that they actually have an experience of it working. That was a long answer to your question. No, it's not difficult. Well, do you run up against, let me ask this question, I don't know if you subscribe to this, Diane, but you know, some people will say that the old world view, it was a design that was intentionally created to keep people from quantum faking. In other words, reality is manipulated. Because a lot of the stuff that you're talking about, to me, goes back to, you're right, it is universal wisdom, but it is occulted knowledge that goes back to the ancient mystery sciences, mystery religions, and has its roots in, uh, at least, you know, from my research, back into mysticism, understanding that you are more than just the five senses, that you're more than just this body, that you have these abilities, these faculties that extend out beyond your immediate mind-body experience. But the vast majority of the population and many people have no wherewithal or understanding of this because their reality is manipulated. What I mean by that is you're not taught these things, that you're constantly bombarded with with images and so on that basically keep you within the five senses to kind of contain you in that space so that you don't think outside the box. I I don't know if that made sense, but... Yeah, it made total sense, Mike. And... You know, this is the really the premise, the the underlying premise of quantum think and what I call my revelation. It's not that people are doing it by choice because, you know, I say mechanical worldview, in many ways we became mechanical too. There could have been a time and even at the beginning of this classical, you know, rational science, where the scientists who were geniuses, you know, Isaac Newton and all these contemporaries, where they said only matter is real, but they were spiritual themselves. But it could have been at the time politically correct to separate off from the clergy from the church, okay? I call it a classical world view sandwich. I'll take matter sliced keep the spirit on the side, and hold the soul. Because, you know, from being in a corporate environment or in any of our kind of public culture, that now it's starting to break through where people are talking more about the soul. But we don't, we haven't lived in what I call living a fully dimensional life where we realize 
that we're living, everything simultaneously takes place in, I name seven dimensions, the physical, energetic, the spiritual dimension of the heart, the esoteric dimension of soul, what you calling mystic, the cosmic principles that are operating throughout, and the divine, the ultimate mystery. But, you know, and of course the virtual dimension of mind. But I have a different spin on it because how I see it is that we tend to project that which is inherent in us, we project into, quote, the objective world. So we objectify that which is within us. For example, our legs become a wheel, become a car, become a plane, become a jet, a rocket ship. Okay? So there's a projection. Our mind becomes the Internet. Our brain becomes a computer. So there's always this exchange. So when you look at this as a world view, and I would like to say a little bit of my story, how I, how I made the discovery. So when you look at, well, maybe we projected, and I say we, I'm talking about as a humanity, that world view because at that time, in the unfolding of humanity and civilization, we needed to create ways of being, of organizing life, of managing life better. And so that age of machines came about because we were somehow clicked into the mechanical way that that we work and we projected it out as a world view. Now, this is a kind of an esoteric conversation. But the point of it being this, that when, think of a machine, once you get a machine to start working, you know, you turn it on and it functions on its own until something goes wrong. So there's no real consciousness, you know, conscious awareness or choice to it. So when you see that in many ways, a lot of our thinking or approaches to life or the way that we relate to life through this separation kind of, you know, you're black, I'm white, you know, you're conservative, I'm liberal, all that either or thinking, I say, came from that worldview that said we need to predict and control nature so that we can have a better life on earth. And it all, in order to predict and control, you had to say something is either this way or that way. So I'm saying how to, that's how it mapped on to thinking. So it's not as though people are at choice in their thinking. So when I hear these conspiracy theories, I think it's not true choice. I call it, and do you call it thing, the myth of choice. We have the opportunity in every moment, to choose our thought. However, to the extent to which we are automatic, mechanical, conditioned in any way, is to the extent that that usurps, that takes away our ability to choose. So I like to free people up from this right now. Because when you start quantum thinking, you take a literal leap in consciousness and you start to look and live from the t- principles, there are 22 in the quantum thing system, instead of looking at them from a more limited, you know, five sensor reality view because you cannot see a more expanded world view. You cannot think in a more expansive way from a more limited You can see the distinction of the limited way of thinking. It taught us to be analytical. It taught us the either or. It taught us to categorize. But we, if you stop there, then you really can create. So look at it this way. When you're quantum thinking, you realize one very important thing. We exist in fields. The fields are invisible. This is science that I'm talking about now. We exist in fields. We're connected through fields. In science, they call this non-locality. The mind is a non-local. What does it mean? It's not located in the sense of an ordinary object in space and time. Why does intuition work? Why does the power of intent work? This is why. 
because our mind, we ha- are existing in a non-local mind field. That means because we're not restricted by the ordinary boundaries of chronological time or physical space. In mind, we're not restricted. Therefore, we can tune in anywhere. And the best metaphor is the Internet. Because if you look at the Internet, the Internet is the infinite mind of humanity, the good, the uh, the bad, the ugly, and the sublime. So what reality are we going to click into? It's going to be what we choose to click into. It's the same thing with our own awareness. So what I say is that because we exist in a field of mind, we're picking up that intel around us. Most of the thoughts we have are not even our own. Not because we've been programmed, but because we're picking up things. Some of it has become, you know, our own habitual thinking does become a neuronal, you know, uh, brain connection. But you don't think it's been programmed? What about things like the media, which continues to uh, portray just negative stuff on the news? Well, that's, and I'm glad you brought that up, because we can get, I'm going to say this, we can get conditioned by something like the media. But it's not like the media is doing it intentionally, except for maybe advertising, which is based on this old world, mechanical world, behavior, stimulus response, Pavlov's dog conditioning. The evolution of psychology at that time in this mechanical world view, that's what evolved. And then later on, as you probably know, became humanistic psychology, and we learned to look at values and Maslow's hierarchy as needs, and it's been even come further since then into a more spiritual view. But the point of it is this. The media, who are people, all of us have grown up under this old world view conditioning, and we have no idea how to use the faculties of mind. Why? Because education, we learn, what do we study? The physical. We study the brain. We study the brain connections. We're not learning these faculties of mind. If we did, and people in the media, as they start to wake up, and they are because we're all in some, there is an awakening going on right now. Yes. And they start to realize, wait a minute, what are we programming in? You know, if it bleeds, it bleeds. I mean, We have maybe programmed people, when I say we, I'm talking about the media, to, you know, think if it bleeds, it leads, you know, put that on, you'll get a higher viewership. I'm not saying these things are not going on, Mike. What I am saying is that as we continue to awaken and we realize that there are real scientifically many times over validated mind to mind and mind to matter connectivity that everything is influencing everything else and then we start to you know put this into our system so that we can learn this because look at what's going on now when i say get a conscious relationship with your mind make your mind your friend which is to say and I'm going to give this one simple exercise. You can make a distinction between a thought that you originate, that you choose, that you initiate, and a thought that I call it, for simplicity, just visits from the surrounding mind field that I like to call now the thought sphere. I didn't write that in the quantum book, but <laughs> <laughs> right? We have a biosphere. We have the thought sphere. We're clever. picking it up, right? I mean, it's influencing, yes. But there's something even more powerful, and that is your very own awakened awareness. In quantum think, we call the, you know, the third principle is it's an infinite possibility universe. You know from being in corporate life, you know, you go into a meeting and uh, somebody brings up an idea, right? Right. Hey, why don't we do, you know, this? And then 
the other people in the meeting room, and they're going, well, you know, we tried that last time. It didn't work. No, I don't think it will work because A, B, C, D. Oh, we don't have the resources for it, and we'll never get it. You know, this is what goes on. Have you experienced this? Oh, yeah, shields up. Right. Right. So what is that? So those are people because, you know, before the show, you asked me about a little bit about how we work, you know, applying this in business, in corporations. And, you know, that is a very important aspect where it's like, wait a minute, in every moment, it's an infinite possibility universe. We can pull in from the surrounding mind field, from this intelligent field that every one of us are part and parcel of, connected to. And, you know, where do sparks of genius, where do these ideas come from? Where do these, you know, taps on the shoulder when people say, oh, you know, I want to live my purpose. Oh, I woke up, now it's coming, and all the signs are here. Where is it coming from? It's coming from this intelligent field. So when you have an intent for something, it doesn't mean, in quantum think, I make a distinction between intent and intention. Intention being an end goal, intent being an activation of the field so that you attract many results that are consistent with your intent. So if you have an idea and people in that boardroom with you are know have the distinction, infinite possibility. Let's think, we can think from infinite possibility. And these kind of limits of the old world mechanical thinking come up. Oh, no, we did it last time. It didn't work. Never worked. They recognize it right away. This is how it works. And I call those least action pathways, least hyphen action being one word, least action pathways, those automatic and mechanical thoughts don't give it any meaning. They're just a vestige of old world, industrial age, mechanical thinking. What do you do with them? They come in, you interrupt them, you notice it. Because we've labeled it. And we go, oh, that's just the least action pathway. Oh, the fact that I think I'll never be able to be successful in the new profession that I really want to do right now that's calling to my heartstrings. Oh, that's just a least action pathway. Oh, that's just the least action pathway of the way that I became accustomed to relating to myself. But guess what? It's an infinite possibility universe. And what is the dynamic of creation for human beings? The dynamic of intent. Oh, okay. Let me interrupt that least action pathway. And what is my intent now? Or what is best and what will work now if you're looking for solutions? So this is how it works. And once you start actually You know, the beauty of a distinction is that once you have the distinction, it's like the proverbial riding the bicycle. Once you've been on the bicycle and you have the distinction, oh, I rode a bicycle. I've held my balance. I know I have to pedal, you know, whatever it is. It's like that. Well, let me ask you a question, though, Diane. Let's say a corporation is struggling to increase its revenues. And, of course, they're doing all kinds of brainstorming and strategy meetings and so on, try to figure out how they get themselves back into the uh, the positive side of the uh, the equation. From a quantum thinking perspective, what exactly would they do? How would the thinking be different versus the old world view? What would that approach look like? I'll tell you what it looks like. First of all, there's also a company mind, what we call a company mind, because the whole, the universe is mind, right? Yes. <laughs> so there's a company mind. Now there's a company mind, which some people call the corporate culture. Right. Right? It is, you could say, there are what we would call the default intent that is present in that corporate culture. What is the default intent? All the different beliefs, assumptions, thoughts, that you have now because the sum of that, the sum of what we hold in our being, whether it's a corporate entity being or whether it's a human individual being, of course, the corporation is made up, right, of the collective of being. Exactly. There is a corporate, it makes another entity called the corporation. So what we hold in our resonant field is what we attract. 
is right. Correct. We know this. So with it as within, so without. Right. So our inner state is attracting that which is in the outer result. These are this is a real thing. So what we would do is we would work. It, it, we sometimes we do it just with the leader. It can work either way, or we've worked with teams where we have the team. I'll give you a real example, okay? This has happened actually a few times, but I'll give you an example. Okay. Of course, I can't say who it is. Oh, because, no problem. I understand. Right. Yeah. But we were working in a corporation. It was a particular unit within a large corporation. And this unit had been acquired in a merger and acquisition type thing. Yeah. And so when you you may know, like a lot of times, what's the least action pathway of that, right? We don't like them. They don't like us. Who are these new guys? Right? That happens. Yeah. If you know about, okay, merger. That's a clash of the cultures many times. Right. A clash of the cultures. So, but this particular unit that we were working with, it was a little bit of the smaller aspect of the, or, it was newer and it was smaller. So they held in, although it had huge potential, which did come about, but they were holding themselves like that. You know, they wanted to be recognized. They weren't in, invited to the important meetings. They didn't get, you know, the financial and other people resources that they felt they deserved. So they were in, you know, like, let's say, not really, but I'm going to call it this, like a whining about it. Uh, you know, the victim. This is what we all do. Right. Right? Uh, woe is me. They don't appreciate me. We're not valued. You know. I've never seen that before. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> but this was as a business unit, okay? So what we did. And, the, you know, the interesting thing is the shift happens almost instantaneously because we are in a world of quantum leaps. And when you understand quantum effects as distinct from linear, step-by-step, step, take all these actions and then you'll be known and then you'll be valued. Well, it doesn't work that way in quantum thinking. The quantum thinking, we know the state that you're in is what's generating your results. So you, when you shift your state, everything shifts with it. And it's a, you know, it's a whole field shift. But the first thing we do is we have them see what is in their current field. I call it the old worldview circle and the new worldview circle to make it simple. Actually, I have an article on this. If you sign up for my mailing list on my website, you will get linked to an article you can't get there from here. And this is what it describes, and it applies it specifically to business, whether you're in a corporate or an entrepreneurial business. Like, very simple. Here's how the old worldview thinks of it. Here's how the new. And I think in part two, I have this about the old worldview, new worldview circle. Okay. But anyway, and my website, I should say at the same time, is diannecollins.com. Diane with two N's. D-I-A-N-N-E-C-O-L-L-I-N-S. And people love this article. Anyway. So the idea is, I say, okay, put the old world view circle. The old world view means your current perspective. You know, all, whatever is coming out of, <laughs> out of your lips, because it's said, people are saying it, people are thinking it, people are holding it as their assumptions, and it's the good, the bad, the ugly, and the sublime. So at the same time, you may be thinking, wow, you know, our business unit has tremendous potential for, you know, increasing the revenues of the corporation. Our business unit has what we offer, our service, is on the leading edge in our industry. So you could have all those good conversations. And then you have the other ones, the limiting conversations. We don't call them negative. We call them limiting because your thoughts will limit you depending on the limits of your thinking. Then there'll be the other thoughts like, well, you know, the rest of the corporation doesn't have, you know, they don't value us and all the things I said before. Right. And then we look at it and we say, okay, there's an underlying theme. <laughs> and the underlying theme, which we would call the unaware intent, intent is always operating. It's either consciously generated or it's generated from the default patterns from the past, the existing patterns. It's like 
You have a computer, it's got the default settings, okay? So these are not consciously chosen. You want to change your, how your computer works, you got to go in and consciously change it. It's like that. So when we might come up with what we did, well, we're valuable, but nobody else, they'll never see it, or something like that. Yeah. Let's just say it's a thematic statement. And then you say, okay, that's your resonant field. So you're actually carrying in your own being. They'll never see it, you see. It's like if you took this as an individual. I want to be a, a recording artist, right. right, singer. But I don't see how to do it. Nobody will ever discover me. I can't get on America's Got Talent. You know, all the other stuff. So you're carrying, but it'll never happen. So that's the proverbial foot on the accelerator and the brake. So the first thing we do is we have them see that, and then we have them distinguish it as a least action pathway of their current culture. A least action pathway has no additional meaning. It's we don't analyze it. We don't say why did it happen. We don't care. It's t the why and the analysis from a quantum thinking perspective is completely irrelevant. You'll never get to the truth of it because there is no truth. You can never get to it anyway because that train left a long time ago. And it doesn't make any difference. The only thing that makes a difference is what is your intent now. And in every moment, we have an opportunity to shift our state, to create a new intent, to create, to generate a transformation that will in turn generate new results. So that's what we do. We show them what they've been operating out of. Then they create a new intent. Now, this particular business unit created the intent. We are the gem of the corporation because they were smaller, right? Right. I mean, it was just something very clever that they came up with. And, you know, then they add things around that, you know, the brilliance of it and people recognize it, many faceted, whatever. But they started to live from that statement of in intent, consciously generated. Now, that completely shifted the whole way that people related to them, that they related to themselves, the amount of resources that they were given, the recognition that they were given, and what they were able to accomplish. That's how we work with quantum thinking in a corporation. That's one way. Now, when you do this, Diane, is there an assessment also of the skills and resources that perhaps may be limiting their ability to, to achieve a goal? We don't work with limits. What we do work with, and by the way, that which I just distinguished is one of the distinctions of the 22 called transformation as distinct from change. The people want, people want to change the things. But the very thing they want to change, they're holding in place. Because in order to change something, you have to keep it in place to change it. If I want to change this pen on my desk, I have to have the pen present. Mm -hmm. But if I want to work with a paintbrush, I don't, I don't even have any attention on that pen. So it's the same thing when we have another distinction in Do You Quantum Think called the hollow movement of purpose. And this is where you distinguish your purpose. And this is another way that we work with companies. And, of course, I feel I'm on a, a campaign for people to really connect to their purpose, but in a very specific way, which means, Mike, you know, not like, well, I'm here for joy. You know, I'm here to bring love. Well, we're all here for that. We're all here for the high virtues. Okay, so that's a given, right? Right. Now, what else are we here for? So, you know, the paradox of being human, we're universally the same and we're individually unique. You know, that snowflake idea. So when you look and you see who is this team you're working with in your company, one of the things we do is we distinguish this, what I call the whole movement of purpose. Now, what does that mean? Whole movement is a word that was coined by the late, great quantum physicist David Bohm. And basically, he meant it as everything in the universe is whole. It's one whole flowing substance. But the reason that we don't see it, we don't experience it that way, 
because there was this constant enfolding and unfolding. So what we see in ordinary reality in this moment, we would call the unfolded aspect. And then we go in, you know, go into the next room and the room I'm in now goes into the enfolded or the hidden aspect. So he called this the whole of movement. So what I'm saying is when you look from the universe as fundamentally a universe of whole systems. Remember, the old world view taught us unwittingly to think in terms of parts and separation. Right. Machine, parts and separation, press on this, that moves, cause and effect was the dynamic. But intent doesn't work as a cause and effect. This is where people get, you know, hung up on, oh, the secret, it didn't work, I had an intention, because it doesn't work as a cause and effect. That's a different conversation. But getting back to the whole of That's a very good point. Yeah, that, it, it's a very, very, you know, Alan, who's my husband, we've been doing this work together for many years, he was listening to one of my shows recently, and I was talking about that, and he, I, you know, I always say, I call him Lover. Lover, what did you get? <laughs> what did he get from the conversation? And he said, "Wow, you know, I got this whole thing like at a deeper level that it's really not cause and effect." Anyway, let me go back to the whole movement. So, the whole movement of purpose. You look at your life as one whole story, like a well-written novel or screenplay. There's nothing in it that's left out. There's nothing in it. That doesn't belong. And because if you look at your life this way, you will see that everything that you've experienced, every job you've had, whoever the people were present in any part of your life, whatever, you know, you had three marriages, two girlfriends, whatever, where you lived, the family you were born into, the country you moved to, the language you speak, is what I call divine, (laughs) infinite intelligence is how we are trained to deliver on our purpose. We each come here with a worldly purpose that is expressed in many ways, infinite ways throughout our life with, you know, key, key stages of it. So now when you're looking at that we're creating this new world together, And we see the dissolution, the dissolving of those systems and structures born from the old world industrial age thinking, kind of crumbling because they've reached their limit of effectiveness. And it's up to us to step forth and know ourselves well enough to know what is it that you and I have been gifted with What talents, gifts, experiences have we been given that we can now deliver to one another? And when you look at nature, nature accomplishes everything through patterns of relationships. So you look in this chapter, the whole movement of purpose, and there are clues in there, you know, I'll explain all this, and then you, it's not just an explanation, it's an experience as you read, that's the idea of my book, but you look at the patterns in your life, and you'll see that what kind of leader are you? That would have been expressed whether you were five years old, 15 years old, 50 years old, because We are born with these particular talents and inclinations, uh, what we attract to ourselves, what people come to us for is a very big clue because somehow on a subliminal level, we know each other. We're connected through that invisible field of energy information and we know, you know, if I come to you, Mike, I know what to come to you for without you ever explaining it to me. And maybe I can't even articulate it, but I'm a quantum thinker, so of course I would be able to. So what we do with a team is we do distinguishing. We don't work on limits because Mm -hmm. in the quantum world, E equals MC squared, what you have attention on, you energize. What you energize, you add mass to and you make more real. So instead of trying to fix what's not 
working or somebody's weakness, we focus on who are they. It's not even what's their strength because that's the old, you know, either or oh, I could do this, but I can't do that. It's the either or thinking and but quantum thinking is both and thinking. So we think, oh, you can do this and you can do this. You like this, but you don't like that. But we look and distinguish, people distinguish for themselves using these clues what their natural proclivities are, what their talents are. And what's great is in a team, when we do this in a company, is that we do this, you know, because we have this um, program that we do called Quantum Think 21. It's a teleconference. We're just about to be doing a new one. We haven't done it in a, in a number of years, but there's a whole website for it, you know, and the reason people like the companies like Quantum Thinking is because people are working on a real-time, real result measurable that they create in keeping with their own vision for their own life and who they are so that naturally they'll be passionate about what they're working on and then each person on the team is contributing to the whole of what that team's, you know, vision, goal, blah, blah, blah is. What is great when we do the whole of movement of purpose is that the people who work with you are giving you the hints. So it's another way that people acknowledge one another for who they are, not like, hey, you did a great job, which is a nice compliment. But when you, when I say to you, what I love about you is that your mind is unlimited. Your thinking is unlimited. You're open to all possibilities. There's no stops. And so in a conversation, in a dialogue, you and I can go anywhere and be totally cut. And that's true about you, right? I like to think of myself that way. Others might argue, though. (laughs) No, I don't think they would. (laughs) I don't think they would. But, you know, well, it depends, you know, and that's the difference between actual thinking and dialogue and opinions. You know, people get, they get attached to their opinions, and then that's where you stop. You know, you don't have to get rid of your opinion, but are you able to think beyond it? That's a real challenge of new thinking, is to not get attached to your own beliefs, assumptions, ideas. Even I have I have to do it, like not be attached to what I think quantum think is. You know, this is something that came through me. Thank you, God, for being, you know, the vehicle of it. But so this is how but this is how it works. So once You have these distinctions. It kind of takes you with it. It's not like you have to think every moment, what was that thought? That's the beauty of the system is that like a road system, you go on the road. If you want to be able to drive from San Francisco to Los Angeles, there's a system that embraces you, that will take you there. There's different routes. You have free will within it. But you don't have to think about being a pioneer (laughs) and going through the rocky roads there because it's set up. And that's the idea of taking a leap in thinking systems is that you take a leap in systems. You don't get rid of the old system. You're just able to distinguish when is that more appropriate, when is analytical thinking more appropriate, when is, when is, you know, open-ended thinking more appropriate. And this is how we begin to command ourselves. Can I run another scenario by you? Sure. If I take it out of the corporate world, and let's just take it down to a person comes to you and says, Diane, I'm struggling with my life. I don't like my job. I'm having a hard time with my finances and having a hard time with my marriage. How would you work with that person? I mean, how would you approach them and, and try to get them into a quantum thinking space? Well, let me say it this way, Okay. Because there are certain essentials that we need to realize. So before when I was talking about, you know, that business unit within the corporation or, you know, one time they thought, oh, you know, we're valuable, but they they don't have any respect for us. And then the new worldview statement was we're the gem of the corporation, which opened up a lot of different things. Neither of those are the truth. The fundamental quantum essential, your thoughts are not the truth. However, your thoughts 
do create your reality. Yes. Your habitual way of thinking creates your reality. So now I'm talking to the person who has all these problems, right, mm -hmm. that you just, I want to say, problems waiting to be solved, who's in a situation. And listen, everybody's got circumstances today that we're dealing with. You know, and things are coming up. This is valid. This is real. So this is not like the Pollyanna panacea, just say it and it's all fine. This is the difference between quantum thinking and positive thinking. One should always have positive thoughts, yes. But if you don't have mastery over your thoughts, even saying, oh, you should have thought positive thoughts, it's like, yeah, that's nice, but right now I'm feeling like crap, you know. So the difference between positive thinking and quantum thinking which gets to this essential, very fundamental, important principle. There are no absolute realities. There are no absolute, other than what you could think of as God divine, whatever you think of for there. For everyday human life, nothing is fixed and solid, including your thoughts and your beliefs. So positive thinking is putting a positive spin, a positive affirmation, on top of a negative belief, on top of a belief that you're holding in your being, in your state of being, as true. And then pretending, Alan says, my husband, it's like putting jelly on top of peanut butter, taking a bite, and pretending the peanut butter is not there. <laughs> it's graphic, right? It's funny. But that's what positive thinking is like from that point of view. Quantum thinking is different because quantum thinking is the realization if there are no fixed way that anything is, then what creates reality? Context. A statement of intent is a statement of context. A statement of context, a statement of intent that I am choosing to live from does not fall into the category of true or false. That is the old world evidence-based Old world view think conceptual thinking. It's right, switches on, based. switches off type of thing. Right. 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 This transcends the true and false. Right? So it's that, okay, so then if my ha habits of thinking, okay, my, it's really my intent in the form of thought experienced as a feeling tone in my being or what we could call resonance, eventually manifests. Well, first it manifests in a relational field. So again, it's not intent, it's not I have an intent and I want a million dollars and it popped into my bank account. It doesn't work that way. So the physical realm is a more dense energy intelligence. It takes longer. But we can have an instantaneous, immediate, effect in the relational field. The relationship to what? Relationship to another person, you can shift instantly. A relationship to yourself, you can shift instantly. And when you do, you start to shape a new reality for yourself. So the first thing I would say to this person is that everything is malleable. There's nothing fixed and solid about your circumstances even if they've been there for 10 years. They are not fixed and solid, nor is the circumstance called your thought. So that's the first fundamental essential quantum principle. There are no absolute fixed realities, including the way you think or what you believe. This is the great news because that means that we get to use the dynamics of creation that we have been divinely born with in order to create what we want. So when you have a thought that is visiting you from the thoughtosphere, you don't have to believe it. It's certainly not the truth for all, you know what I mean, absolute truth, truth for all times. There's nothing you can do about it. No, it's not the truth. Most of the time, it's not even yours. But the point is you do not have to identify with any thought that is coming into your mind field unless it is a thought that is conducive to what you desire, to how you want to feel. 
Okay? So that is the first thing. Make the distinction between a thought you want to have and a thought that is not yours. Let it, we say, let it fly by like a bird past your window. So the first thing is to realize in every moment you have the opportunity to shift your circumstances. The second essential principle is that we are living in a mind-based reality. And we've been talking about that. But we need to know that. Therefore, we need to learn something about these faculties of mind that I call intent, intuition, subtle energy, resonance, and meditation. And that we can learn it quite easily and start to take this on as, oh, okay, I can master these. The third thing is that it's an observer-created reality. What does that mean? That means, I say it in Do You Quantum Think, the subtitle of that chapter is, What You Bring is What You Get. And what that means is that the assumption that you bring to an observation, meaning an observation doesn't mean just visual, it's not a perceptual observation. An observation is whatever you hold in your awareness. So if you're going to a business meeting, if you're going to a family dinner, and what are you bringing to that family dinner? You have, you know, a whole set of assumptions about your Auntie Molly, who you think, you know, talks too much, and, you know, she ruins the dinner, and nobody can ever get a word in, or, you know, you could have all these assumptions about a person, right? As if they are fixed and solidly that way. Well, as a quantum thinker, but you do this in your own life, you know, because you gave me a big scenario. You know, <laughs> marriage is no good. I lost my I job. I got fair. no money. <laughs> right. But it doesn't matter. It still works because these are the dynamics of creation that we have been divinely bestowed with. So, you know, it's up to us to learn to use them. Now, whatever situation you're going into, I'm picking the family dinner, that you catch yourself in those least action pathway thoughts about your Auntie Molly, and you realize, okay, my thoughts are not the truth, even if I have evidence from the past. What is my intent with regard to my relationship? This is where we talk about relational fields. It's not a cause and effect. It's not a push and pull. It's not like, I want my Auntie Molly to be, you know, quiet (laughs) and loving. and No. It doesn't, it's not that way. We create an intent for the experience that we want the family dinner to have. By the way, I do this all the time. My mother, who's, you know, 90 something and whatever, right? (laughs) She has a lot of years of practice, but she's always learning and growing and it's great. And why? Because we should have these kind of conversations. So it's like, what? Because relationships can build up their own least action pathways. You know, you can become habitual in the way your relationships go. Right. That can be interrupted. So you go to the family dinner, you interrupt your own, what you're bringing to your observation of your Auntie Molly, and you create an intent, not for Auntie Molly, for the experience. I am so happy that my intent is our family is experiencing at this dinner, like, the best conversation we've ever had, the most fun, everybody's happy, it's going smoothly, you say it in the present tense. And because you're holding that within you, you've shifted your state. I say it like this. It takes one to tango in a quantum world. Why? Because of we exist in fields. That's, by the way, the fourth essential thing to know. And mind is connected to mind. We are shaping the field through what we hold in our awareness. So as soon as you shift, everything shifts with you, even before you get physically to that dinner. And by the way, you can also shift things in reverse. And it's that, you know, the scientists say things move backward and forward through the quantum field. Right. So, again, 
quantum thinking is not about science. It's about how we can use the discoveries of science to shape the way we think. So if you think, oh, things can move forward, you know, sometimes I'll have an experience with a person. You know, I'll think, well, that didn't go well. Or, you know, you come out of being with someone and you just have a feeling like you're not feeling (laughs) exuberant about the experience. Yeah, I know exactly what you're saying, right. There's a little bit of, like, you know, fragmentation there in the field. Right, right. It's a little hard edge about it, right? Maybe a little distance, a little whatever that's in the air. Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then you start, what do we do? You know, we start thinking, what did I do wrong? You know, I call it going into the least action pathway, wretched self syndrome. It's got to go because we're not. And the reason I use wretched self syndrome is I had a great teacher, Swami Muktananda, who uh, has passed, but was the head of the Siddha Yoga lineage, med- great meditation master. And he said, the worst sin is to think of yourself as a wretched little creature. So I call it wretched self syndrome. It's got to go. Any form of the, I'm not good enough, I did bad, <laughs> all of that. A lot of people think that way. I, well, because of these automatically stacking pathways. Again, don't grab onto the thought. Let it fly by. Oh, there's that least action pathway. Great. Fly by like the bird past my window. Now, what is my intent for myself? So what I'll do is I think, okay, I need to shift the field right now. Because it could have been that it was some you met with someone where you near, really wanted a specific result, right? right? Maybe a business result or in some way, You wanted something to happen that now you're worried might not happen. (laughs) And so you, and it won't happen as long as you're resonating that it won't. So what do we do? We shift our resonance. So again, we can shift the resonance even though that interaction with the person already happened. Because when you shift, you know, two people that are who who are tuned in to the same field. And, of course, whoever your relationship, whoever you are in relationship with, you are tuned into the same field. So that's why family fields are very, very strong amongst the strongest fields. And this is why it's really important to think well of your family, to think healthy, healthfully of your family. You don't want to think... Oh, you know, I don't know, you know, mom's starting to lose, you know, her memory. No, you want to ha- always hold the intent. Family is healthy, happy, and enjoying their life. This is what I would be telling them. I would be saying these five essentials. And then the last one, so I've said the fourth one is we exist in fields, and therefore we always have the opportunity to shape the field of resonance. and. When you master your mind, you master your life. Now, I'm not talking about mind control, you know, like some outside force or like you're going to... It's not a manipulation. No, you're talking about people doing their inner work. That's exactly right. Right. So this is what this is all about today. It really is looking from the whole of life today the accelerating pace. We need to be able to think in sinks. Like there is a distinction beyond time in in quantum thing. It's like that we're using, I call it, from tyrant to tool. Because if you get hung up today in this changing world and you become a, quote, victim of chronological time, This is where people are starting to experience stress and burnout because, you know, we've all been conditioned under the old world view that said go step by step in a linear fashion. Time only moves one way and, you know, and we're huffing and puffing trying to catch up. Well, this is why it's so important to really master these faculties of mind, Mike, because of the changing conditions of the world that we're living in. Because we absolutely are 
continuing to use chronological time. But you can use chronological time and be in a state where you are operating in this both end of beyond time and using chronological time to your advantage, the way it's meant to be used, but not allowing yourself to be limited by it. And this is where something like we think of the faculty of intuition, which is really so important, because intuition is our connection into this intelligent mind field, this infinite intelligence, where the mind, because it's not located, it can go anywhere. It doesn't actually go. It connects in like the Internet, as I said earlier. So when you start to take this particular faculty of mind, intuition, seriously, you know, we all use intuition all the time. But we haven't distinguished it as such. You know, sometimes we'll go, oh, my God, I was thinking of my sister and she called, right? Right. That's the most obvious. Well, yeah, we are connecting in to that. What we don't realize is we can do that as a conscious act. This is what it is. You know, what is quantum thinking? You asked at the beginning. Quantum thinking is living consciously, right. knowing that you're doing it. So you can start to use your intuition consciously. That makes life so much easier because instead of having to read through the 200 or 2,000 emails that come into your inbox, right? Or, you know, there's all this information. It's so good. What are you going to take advantage of? You can start to get connected through the use of your intuitive faculty so that sometimes, you know, all of a sudden you'll click on something and it was like, right, I really needed that message. But it wasn't because you had to take the linear step-by-step, let me read every email and see what it says, not that we don't have time to do it. So we need these other faculties of mind so that we can have a more joyful life. Very key here is, and what I tell a lot of folks, a lot of my clients, is that you can develop your intuition. Many people take it for granted, and they just think it's something that happens haphazardly in their life. That's exactly right, Mike. You can develop it. And so it really is having an intent to develop it. Exactly. That's exactly right. And there are many ways of doing it. And one way is to pay attention to those, I call it the silent tap on the shoulder. Mm -hmm. But, you know, intuition comes in many ways. It can come, some people get a voice. Some people get a feeling, like kinesthetic feeling in their body. Some people get... A sense of knowing. Yeah, I get the knowing. That's my, we all have all of it, but I, my primary way is I, is knowing, which is a little bit, you know, it's a little challenging because you don't feel anything, you don't see anything. I've had in some very significant situation, one time that literally saved my dad's life at the time, where words came in, like a very clear message of what he needed for his health. But one way of developing your intuition is when you Get an intuition, an intuitive pulse, pay attention to it. Right. And the more you pay attention to it, the more it happens. What's your primary way? It's a feeling. It's a sense of knowing. Like you said, it, you know, it hits uh, many facets of, of receiving it. But many times for me, it's just a feeling I get, you know, or it's, it's knowing that this is the right thing to do, or this is the right path to be on. That's how it comes to me. Yeah. You know, and so many people forsake it, you know, they just blow it off and uh and then they sit there and they think to themselves, they find themselves in a place they don't want to be and they're like, How'd I get here? Right, and then they go, I knew I should have taken this <laughs> and this is what I'm saying about when you master these faculties of mind, how much fun life becomes. Right. Because you start to make some different kind of decisions for yourself and the important thing is that you're confident in the decisions. Because sometimes, I had this happen to me today where I was invited into two opportunities that in the past 
I would have been an automatic yes, right? It sort of became, it became a least a pathway of mine. You know, you're invited into this. Okay, I'll do it, you know. And I've been reevaluating for myself, you know, a new direction for myself. And I thought, you know what? This, these opportunities, they're so delicious, you know. It's like, you know, that ice cream sundae you want, but you know you shouldn't be eating that right now. And, you know, it looks good, it is good, but right now it's not right for me. Right. And even though I said no to it, I said no not knowing what my new path would be because it was part of, like, a path I had been on. Mm-hmm. I don't want to go into specifics of what it no, is. No, that's fine. I understand you know, exactly right. what you're saying, okay. though. Yep. But it's like saying no to that, and this is my point, because I have the inner confidence, the inner knowing that it was the right thing to do, but I'm not sure why yet. So this is an aspect of quantum thinking also, is that you can, in any given moment in space-time, you can only really see, I use 10% of the situation, but, you know, I, if you look at the science, you know, the scientists say they can only ever see, you know, right now they can see 4% of the material universe. The other 96% is dark, they call dark matter or dark energy. It doesn't mean that it doesn't, there isn't a force there. Right. There's right. something very powerful there. But they can't see it. So I use this analogously, but I like to use 10% because it's easier. So let's say you can only ever see, even what you can imagine, you know, because I can imagine, well, maybe it'll be this path, maybe I'll get that opportunity, maybe I'll create this for myself. So that's part of the 10%. What's existing right now in your circumstances and what you can even envision, that's still only in the 10%. And then there's the other 90% of this co-creative infinite intelligence that's working with us all the time. If only we would tune in and make the request. So the request is in the form of intent. The receiving is in the form of the intuitive. So when you learn to work with these, as you say, as a regular basis. And again, it's not that people haven't wanted to. It's that we were never exposed to thinking of it this way. That's exactly right. Because of that old world, physical only, you know, in a physical only world, you're not going to school and learning about intuition. I mean, just imagine young people, kids, learning how to use your own mind I know. in this way. Critical thinking is one thing, but this is talking about even more because it's going into the nature of mind and how it works and how we connect to one another and how we connect to creating results. So even when the 90% is unknown, when you realize that this power of intent is working, not because I say it is, I'm just distinguishing what each of us know so that it's brought into our awareness in such a way that we have a new relationship to it. This is what I call the art of distinguishing, a new worldview of learning. And then once we distinguish it this way, it's like, yeah, it's it activates that. It integrates within us, Mike. And so the next time you're in a situation where you want to tap into your intuition, that's where the meditative state becomes important because, you know, we really need to be in that quiet, still, that stillness inside so that we can hear it. Right. Do you find that, too? I do find that. First of all, I want to go back to something you said before, just uh, for everybody who's listening, yeah, listen closely. Meditation is very important because that's where you get your messages in that stillness. Otherwise, what we're doing is we're running around all the time and, you know, we're thinking about I have to be here, I have to be there, I have this appointment, I got to get the kids to a soccer game or whatever it may be. And your mind is completely preoccupied with all these other thoughts. But what I explain to my clients 
Diane, is if they can just get some quiet time, 20, 25 minutes, hopefully every day would be great, but if they can't, I tell them maybe four or five times a week, and just go inward. Just listen. I ask them sometimes, I'll tell them, put a question out there, and be in a stillness and wait for an answer to come. And some people think it's woo-woo stuff, and what I say to them is, just try it. Give it a shot. You have nothing to lose. But you see, again, that woo-woo comment... And that's a very good practice, and you can even start with five minutes, even one minute. Right. But you know what? That woo-woo comment is, again, a vestige of the old world. You see, our, the container for thinking, <laughs> think of it this way, we have to have a container, you know, a way of thinking. This is why I said in the very beginning, new thinking is not just a new or a clever idea or an out-of-the-box idea. It's a new framework. It's time to expand the framework for thinking. And so with the woo-woo and that la-la land, this is what we call, you know, there's nothing wrong with anybody for saying that. It's that that's somebody, which is means all of us, me included, who have been brought up under a set of assumptions about the nature of reality, which is limited at best and inaccurate. So when we open ourselves to this more accurate point of view, so you're telling your clients, and, you know, wisely so, you know, you're giving some really great practices because the meditative state, I consider it a faculty of mind, not only a practice, but the practice helps. It's like I'm a tennis player. So you can go out and you can pick up a racket and a ball and go out and there's a net and you hit the ball. That certainly doesn't give you any distinction for playing tennis. Then you can get a lesson. And then, that's good. Wow, I was able to hit the ball over the net with a proper form. Now, it takes practice. You, Like I just said, I'm a tennis player. I used to think of myself not as a natural athlete in any way, athletic. But somehow, I'm a good tennis player. (laughs) You know, because the idea is that it integrates. And then all of a sudden... You are a tennis player, so you come to the learning from being a tennis player. So in meditation, if you understand meditative state is one of the f- natural faculties of us. It's it's in us. Yes. It's not something like, I don't know how to meditate or, you know, what do I do? It's already there. So what you're doing when you sit down in any practice of meditation, of which there are many types, the one that you have is wonderful because it's a contemplation and then you listen and it it invokes the intuition and everything. But when you sit down and you just, it's more like clearing the atmosphere of your being, you know, like what you said. All that, you know, what am I going to make for lunch? And what do I have to go tonight? And so what happens from a both-and perspective is that eventually, like what I was saying about, what I brought up about the tennis, you come to your meditation. You come to life as already in the meditative state so that you can be in know yourself as that state of focused or we could say awareness of your own awareness, you know, watching what's in your mind, watching yourself in action and fully engaging in the action at the same time. Right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, excellent. Excellent. Really, Diana, I mean, to be honest, I mean, this has been really a fascinating conversation and I'm really glad that uh, we connected. Me too. Me yeah. too. Thank Excellent. you so much. Oh, you're very, very welcome. And you mentioned your website before, which was DianeCollins.com. Right. Diane with two N's. Okay. And to purchase your book, is that Amazon or are there other sites? Um, yeah, it's, in, uh, it's my book is available wherever books are sold. So it's in hardcover, which I love. 
and it is also in all ebook editions, which I also love. <laughs> I have both, of course. Well, we use it all the time. You know, it's really, I call it a friend for life. A good way to read Do You Quantum Think, by the way, the name is Do You Quantum Think, New Thinking That Will Rock Your World, is when you have a contemplation, something you're contemplating, open it anywhere. Because of the genius of the non-local mind field, not because of the genius of my book, but, you know, we're all genius in some way, <laughs> you will you will connect in to the exact right passage. So, you know, we use it all the time ongoing because it's we're all learning to quantum thing. So anyway, it's in all the ebook editions, hardback, and it's available online, Barnes and Noble, uh, books a million, Amazon, everywhere, and in stores, and you can order it if it's not in your store. And I do really invite people to come onto my website, dianecollins.com, and to sign up for my mailing list. I don't send out a lot of things, so I will not be bombarding you, but I have just started blogging on the Huffington Post. Oh, is that right? Yeah, and I'm really excited. I've only, I've done two blogs. And you have a Facebook I'm, page too, yes? Yeah, I have a Facebook page, and um, you know when I'm sending sending something out, I you know use that the email list for that. For usually, I like to send content or you know having people be aware of any offerings we have. But when you sign up, you'll get the link to the article. You can't get there from here, meaning you take the quantum leap there, and then everything unfolds. Beautifully. So thank you very much for letting me share and to share with you. It's been great. You hold such a wonderful, expansive space for conversation. And I really appreciate that. Well, right. thank you, Diane. Thank you so much. And you know, you can come back anytime. You know, just email me or, you know, give me a ring if you have an update or if you just want to chit chat and, uh, you know, talk about stuff. You're more than welcome. Right. More than welcome. And that concludes my discussion with Diane Collins, and I hope you enjoyed the interview as much as I did. Diane's website can be found at www.diannecollins.com, and that's Diane with two N's. And her book, Do You Quantum Think?, can be purchased at Amazon.com. And as always, I'd like to thank everyone for listening and for visiting the blog, sageofquay.com. Also, please take a listen to my album, Leaving Dystopia, by heading to laboroflovemusic.com. And remember, live in truth, and always serve creation. It's really that simple. See everyone next week. Be safe, enjoy, and God bless.